welcome everyone who's coming in. Seeing the number start to tick up here. It's a good, good crowd today, good audience. Welcome everyone and thank you for spending your uh, Tuesday lunchtime with us. We have an exciting program today. It's a part status update on Normandy, uh, what's new, what we can expect when we visit in the fall. Uh, really looking forward to hearing about some exciting new things that have been developed and uh, for that we'll have uh, Christophe Gosselin, one of our tour guides in Normandy here with us. And then part uh, historical a lecture, kind of like a podcast thing with Michael Nyberg, where we'll be discussing uh, the liberation of Paris. And he might even give us a little bit of insight, maybe a, a cheat into his next book that'll be due out in October of this year about relationships with the Vichy regime. Um, but first, we, Christophe went around Normandy and, and um, got some welcomes and some footage from some of our friends who are over there. And uh, first, I, I kind of view him as the the statesman of the Normandy region, uh, Charles de Valleve, uh, owner of Braycourt Manor, mayor of Saint Marie Dumont, and uh, curator, and really the guy behind the Utah Beach Museum. And uh, we have him here uh, standing in his field next to his, his gorgeous Norman cows. Uh, it's sort of a thing that somebody has to compliment his wonderful cows every time we go, and we might get the chance to uh, see a little bit more on his property. But uh, here's Charles. My name is Charles de Valavieille. I am the owner of Breco Manor and also the uh, curator of Utah Museum and the mayor of saint marie du mont It's a pleasure to see you the next time. And Charles, any time that we bring a group there, uh, Charles comes out, he's developed his own tour guide flipbook. He'll look at somebody like Christophe and just say, you stand over there, help me with a word if I don't know it. Um, but he has turned into his own tour guide of his own property. And this, of course, the episode two of Band of Brothers, the scene at Braycourt Manor, Dick Winters leading that group to neutralize that German gun battery that was in that hedgerow that you see right behind Charles here. And uh, he can't wait to uh, welcome our groups back, whether they're students like you see in the photograph here or all of our leisure groups, uh, hopefully first time uh, we'll see him on some easy company programs that we have scheduled in September. And of course, our Seine River Cruise with Michael Nyberg in October, November of next year. Uh, for a little bit of what you'll see of Braycourt, this is a shot that Christophe took from the corner of his property where an easy company monument was installed several years ago. and looking out into that field toward that hedge that I uh, had the picture of Charles standing in front of uh, just a little bit ago, um, hearing the birds chirp. And it just brings me back to that, that site. Um, the fence is electric too. That's the first thing we have to do when we arrive is somebody has to go find Charles and get him to turn the electricity off. Uh, hopefully he doesn't forget uh, before he, he gets us into our field. Sometimes we get a little bit of mud, uh, but the chance of viewing the berms of those hedgerows standing where those guns were and having the owner, uh, it's been in his family for generations, having the owner of that property explain to us what was there and the times that he talked to the Easy Company veterans who had come back, whether it was Don Malarkey, uh, we bring Brad Freeman back uh, periodically or when he met with Dick Winters who told him the version of the story uh, that Charles will tell. Um, it's just a, a great experience. And when you go to the museum, the Utah Beach Museum that Charles' own father inaugurated, um, you get a little section on the Battle of Brecor while you're in there too, in the midst of all of the other information on Utah Beach. <laughs> That was the best defense he could put together. And at Brecor, the Germans had been smart enough to uh, conceal in a hedge, hedgerow and camouflage it very well. And that was uh, Dick Winter's voice that you were listening to that plays on that monitor uh, as he explains what the mission was, what the result was, and the maps that they had found in there showing the defenses in the Utah sector. Um, so very well done corner of this museum and something that we always point out to our guests when we're there. 
Uh, shifting now to, to another Charles, this being uh, Charles Shea, uh, veteran of the 1st Infantry Division, a Penobscot Indian uh, from uh, the Northeast, and now makes his home in Normandy. And several years ago, he inaugurated a memorial to the Native Americans of D-Day at about the midpoint of Omaha Beach. So now uh, Christophe from a few weeks ago is gonna take us on a walk from where the sign is of this memorial uh, down to Omaha Beach and uh, a bust of Charles himself. And uh, Christophe will talk a little bit more about it. He took the easy path on the grass. I usually make people walk the sand uh, to get the feel for that. You see that there's all the two paths there, but uh, Christophe will definitely talk about Charles. Uh, Charles has been at a few events, uh, inaugurating a few new uh, memorials and monuments in Normandy, oftentimes as the uh, lone American World War II veteran uh, to be around at some of these events. Now, if you're in this section of Omaha Beach and you're coming across the coastal road from the Charles Shea Memorial, you'll come across a bunker. And this is a very famous one. A lot of you have seen the picture of the 2nd Infantry Division marching single file up the cliff. And they're marching past this particular uh, strong point, uh, Wiederstrand's Nest or WN65. And Christoph took a few uh, shots of this, uh, something that I think we all expect to see when we're in Normandy. and also heading a little bit inside. So uh, Christophe, I'm gonna bring you in now and I'll, I'll take us off screen share for a little bit. I don't think we're quite back to this point of these kind of groups, uh, you taking them up to places like Aramanche, uh, holding as high as you can those pictures of what this mulberry looked like in 1944, um, as, as you very skillfully explain it here. But I think we're, we're getting close. We're about to have these types of groups again. But um, I guess I wanna ask you first, uh, do you miss us over in Normandy? Do you miss uh, the Americans stomping around? I miss you immensely. <laughs> That's uh, so. First, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, that is, uh, you know, in preparing all of that, I was so excited to do that. You know, there was like, well, we're going to welcome people because over the past uh, eighteen months, really, I think uh, I was on tour with uh, four Americans. All right, I had two tours, two couples. And that's uh, frustrating, uh, that's all, because we like to share all the stories, all the sites. You saw that um, the way that Charles de Valavier speaks, and as you said earlier, Nathan, he made his own, you know, uh, flip-flop book with uh, his own guiding of the property. And he, he made the point, you know, to speak himself, to welcome American people. And the same for me, you know, when I'm in this big bus, red or blue bus, uh, for the National Water Museum. You know, we are ha happy to share uh, the local experience, the American experience, the British experience as well. So we kind of mixed a lot of uh, topics together. And uh, not speaking about this, we, we are um, scared to lose our uh, skills as well. You know, we, we need this relationship with you uh, to develop, uh, develop along the years, by the way. And um, that's really very important to us. So you went around, you saw a lot of the museums. What, what is Normandy like at this point? Uh, you know, Americans can go to France, it's largely open. Uh, what, what's it like to go around now compared to previous years? 
Yeah, that's that's where you see how how important uh, became American guest along the years, uh, thanks to Stephen Ambrose probably when he put the topic on the table a few years back, and uh, that is kind of empty when you go to the to the museums. You know, they are uh, you can't see that about thirty percent of. Uh, uh, the, the customers of those this area is uh, American. So in some places, it's it's almost fifty percent. So that's that's a bit strange, I would say. Um, and what I like very much, for example, and every time I had the oppor opportunity to do that, I discuss with Americans who came because they live in Germany, for example. You know that uh, there are many American um, service people that leaves uh, they live in in Germany. So. They come to Normandy. They came last year to Normandy, and they come this year again. Uh, some of them work in the industry, for example. And it's always interesting to discuss. Well, uh, how did you do to, to come? <laughs> what, what happened to you? What what is the, and why is it this so important? And all the time, you know, uh, they say they they speak about their lack of knowledge about all of this, but their great interest and the uh, the will to learn more. And I really appreciate that very much. Uh, with our guests in the in our buses, usually people in our buses are are, are knowledgeable. You know, they they do their homework. You know, they read a lot. They 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 are engaged in the tours. Um, but not speaking only about the tours, but about the American the Americans in Normandy. Uh, they are part of the social life here. So uh, last tour I had last year with a young couple. Maybe you're you are surprised to hear that, but there are very young people coming to Normandy as well. So last year, the, the, they were about 25 years old and the, the gentleman uh, got his promotion and was um, abroad you know, in Germany uh, in a factory, a candy factory for uh, Werther's original. And um, we went and they hadn't a coffee in the morning. So we stopped by at Omaha Beach to a cafe and when I told to the owner that they were Americans, you know, he heard them. He kind of cheered them like, like you cannot imagine how happy he was. Oh, you're back. What, what, what's going on? And I had to calm him down a little bit explaining that, well, they are from Germany. In fact, uh, they are Americans, but living in Germany. So uh, the other Americans have to wait a little bit more. But now as uh, many, many Americans are uh, fully vaccinated, that is possible. And this is the good news to us. So have you had any tours recently with Americans or any upcoming in the next few weeks? And how have their trips been over? Have they told you what, it's, what it was like for them to get there? Well, first, they really enjoy. I had a few, uh, very few, unfortunately, but uh, they really enjoy um, being here uh, without the big crowd, you know? Um, so they really like the experience. And um, the last ones I, I had, they did... Uh, the landing beaches and also Rouen and Honfleur. So it was also cultural and battlefield tours, uh, which sometimes when you do the pre-tours, uh, you, you, you can enjoy that as well. So they kind of had a large perspective on Normandy and um, they really enjoyed it very much because there were very few people on touristy locations. Uh, it was in June, so normally that's packed. <laughs> Uh, they were surprised, and I say well, yes, but usually in June they are mostly Americans. So as they cannot come over, that's the reason why. So really, they they were so surprised by so many new things in the area. So we, you know, the pandemic didn't stop. You know, all the monuments, all the new experiences, even the movies and museums. The museums, um, I cannot say. Uh, took advantage of this uh, slow time to renovate or to do new displays like in the D-Day experience uh, that you know very well in saint côme du mont uh, about the power troopers mostly. They did new rooms with new displays and that's really great. And I had that picture of you in Aramage with the, the mulberry and right behind us would have been the cinema circulaire, the 360 yeah. degree cinema. Uh, for many years, they had a, a film that was, it didn't matter what language you spoke, you understood it. Uh, but they took the time to create a, a new film. And you said you had a chance to go see that. So so what's new there? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I was lucky enough to, to go there a few weeks ago, uh, just after they released the movie, which was in June. So um, 
it's it's interesting because they uh, did a new uh, focus, and that's a question of many of our guests in our tours about the French population. So formally, they hadn't any pictures, images of uh, of the French locals uh, in destroyed cities and so on. That is what the new film um, bring, which is really new. Um, also, they were concerned about the fact that, uh, maybe you remember that, Nathan, that they, they had a very loud moment where the, the firing of uh, battleships, and that was kind of stressful, even, even to us, sincerely. We, we're used to that, but um, uh, even young people, in fact, were a bit scared by this. And I think it was probably too much for the um, elderly crowd, so they probably took it off from, from the, the movie for that reason. Um, but it doesn't alter too much the experience of being there in a 360 uh, circular um, uh, theater, movie theater. So, which is interesting because you have to look to the left, to the right, and just to, to see new, new pictures coming to the place. And they show the soldiers preparing the invasion. They show the, the, the local civilians who suffered from air bombings, but also the liberation when they cheered the soldiers. So that's kind of a full experience. Uh, it's not too long, you know, that's very, very well, um, very profitable uh, 15 minutes, you know, that's, uh, I would say they, they made a great deal with that. And I think it's, it's a good point. And so we had two Charles that we talked about and uh, that had the videos, one to the memorial and one a welcome. Uh, each of them had a hand in something new uh, that our guests will be able to experience uh, this year. Yeah, you're right. Uh, maybe should I start with uh, Charles Shea, the World War II veteran, who, um, uh, with the, he's, you know, he lives in Normandy now. So last year, he was the only American veteran uh, in the ceremonies. This year, he was invited everywhere. And another American veteran, uh, I don't know how he did, but he came. He was from the 90th, uh, he's from the 90th Division. And um, he came to Utah Beach only, but Charles was absolutely everywhere for the opening, the great opening of the, the British Memorial, where 20,000 plus names are written on it. And himself, he was involved in a project this year, which is the C-47 Memorial Garden um, in Picoville. You know, in this small town, small village, uh, I think it's about nine uh, American C-47s crashed there. So one of them, uh, there were 16 killed and uh, uh, power 16 uh, uh, power troopers killed and four crew members. And they, I have the book, by the way, about this. And you know, they found a dog tag in this field 77 years after. And they sent it to the family. So the, the name of the gentleman is La Ferrada. Uh, La Ferrara, sorry, and La Ferrara family now, they're going to get the dog tag of their family member who died uh, 77 years ago. So that's kind of an impressive. So Charles was, is very involved in the, in the preservation of the memory, in the education to young people. And uh, the, the American consulate um, of Rennes, of Western France, uh, was also there with military people also there. Um, so that's kind of interesting. You know, they contacted generals mm -hmm. uh, and they always say yes to Charles. And that's kind of an honor and very nice to see uh, to see how involved they are. They even sold, uh, maybe can I show you that? It's behind me. It's in, we are in my office, all right? So that's always behind me. And Charles signed up a plaque for the C-47 uh, Garden Memorial that they sell 20 euro, I think, just to make some money to, to have a very nice monument. It's kind of the shadow of a C-47 on the ground. They also have um, uh, Virginia trees, uh, Virginia tulips or trees and, and that kind of things, you know, that's kind of very, very interesting garden. And, and uh, they're going to have a, a, li a little lookout, a small lookout that you can see the, the spire of the church where they came by before the crash. So that's very moving. That's historically accurate, and that's what, what Charles liked to do, and he did that beautifully. And so Charles de Bellieve at uh, Brecor Manor, uh, the, the closest town to Brecor would be Saint-Marie-du-Mont, uh, famous battle, you know, battleground for the 101st Airborne Division, yeah. uh, but uh, Charles installed another monument in Saint-Marie-du-Mont as well. 
you know how important it is for, for Charles because his father is the founder of the museum, as you said, it's the former mayor of St. Marie Dumont. So that's, uh, that's important. And he refused for years to be the new mayor, you know, uh, but now he took responsibility and also to do that kind of project with an American association, I should mention that uh, there is Operation Democracy, uh, that's an American association and led by Mr. Ivanov. Uh, his name, I think it's Stephen Ivanov. Um, Mr. Ivanov is a former, is a, is a former US captain, the, uh, a Green Barrett, that um, kind of organized everything to do the Normandy French Resistance Memorial. And that's a bit ironic, you know, and some people went to see Charles and say, well, why are the Americans uh, doing this monument? Why not us? I said, well, you had 77 years to do so. <laughs> so why didn't you do that? So they proposed me and I said, yes, I think it's a good idea to honor and enlight. And, and especially it is with the, uh, the sculptor is an American sculptor. I don't know if you know him, but you know him you, yourself, but I don't know if the, the, the audience, uh, um, knows him. Uh, his name is Stephen Spears. And, you know, he's the one who made the monument on Utah Beach and also the Leadership Monument, mm -hmm. uh, Dick Winter's monument. And he also made the bust of Charles Shea that you saw on the on my video. So that's the same artist. And he kind of mixed everything with a... So there is, a, I like especially, there's a pigeon on the table for... You know, pigeon message carriers, uh, representing also a, a lady, a female French resistant, and two men, one with a bike. Uh, the other one is doing, uh, the lady I think is doing a uh, radio communication. So all the purpose and the big roles in the French resistance are represented in one very nice monument. And the, Christophe's just emblematic of the guides we work with in terms of keeping on top of things during the pandemic, joining us on these webinars, uh, speaking English so they're not rusty when we send our first groups back to them. Uh, Christophe, if you could, you have a book behind you and that'll help me transition to our next yeah. speaker. Uh, but if you wanna uh, just sort of bring the book close up to the screen. Before to show you that, may I say something? Um, first, uh, you know, that's what I like to do with you, with the National Water Museum. We meet authors and we, we sometimes become even good friends. And Mike is one of them, sincerely. He's so friendly with tour guides from France and he speaks fluently in French, of course. And that's uh, the great book you can buy about the French in English. Um, uh, the Blood of the Free, of Free Men and the Revolution of Paris 1944 by Michael Nyberg. And that's a great book. That's really, and have my son copy. I hope it will worth a million dollar in a century. So I'll give it to my son. <laughs> so if you, if you don't take Kristoff's word for it, and you're not going to take my word for it, that it's a great book, we'll have you take Mike Nyberg's word for it himself. Uh, so he'll be joining us on the River Seine, or the beaches of Normandy to the River Seine. And uh, Mike's going to give us a little taste uh, today of one of his lectures about the liberation of Paris. Uh, 1944. So, uh, Michael, it's it's all yours. Thanks so much, Nathan. And it's just wonderful, Christoph, to hear your voice and to see those images of Normandy. And it's been too long since I've been over in France with this uh, insane pandemic. So uh, I'm excited to go back. Even just hearing the bird songs in the uh, in the short videos made me think of Normandy. And so uh, I'm excited to get back to France. I'm glad to hear that things are starting to get to, to some semblance of, of normal. Uh, what I'd like to do is really do two things with you very quickly. One is to give you a little bit of some of the history of the liberation of Paris. And then what I'd like to do is show you some of uh, what Paris looks like today, what some of those places look like today and the way that they've been memorialized and the, the ability that you'll have to go and see them uh, either on your own or with a, with a tour like Christophe's or something through the museum. So this is a famous picture of American soldiers coming down the Champs-Élysées, coming down uh, on, underneath the Arc de Triomphe uh, and a very famous photo, very famous image from August of 1944. And I like to start with this quotation. Hang on a second, please. I like to start with this quotation from the uh, great American journalist, Ernie Pyle. Uh, Ernie Pyle had seen the worst of World War II. He actually dies just outside of um, Okinawa on an island called Ishima later in the war. Uh, Ernie Pyle had seen Omaha Beach. He had seen 
really some of the, the, the worst of the war. And he wrote these words about the liberation of Paris. He wrote, I had thought that for me, there could never again be any elation in war, but I had reckoned without the liberation of Paris. And we'll talk a little bit about why uh, that is, but you can see the joy on people's faces here. Paris is of course, not the only city in Europe to be liberated during World War II, but it had a special symbolism because of what Paris meant, not just to Europe and not just to France, but to the entire world. And also because Paris is gonna escape the Second World War with very little damage, which makes it very different from Warsaw, very different from Berlin, very different from other European capitals. Another veteran war correspondent tried to write a, a report, tried to write something for his editors on what he'd seen at the liberation of Paris. He gave up and he just wrote back to his editors, the whole thing is beyond words. So this is a very special moment in the history of the war. But what I wanna do is kind of explain a little bit about what's going on, why it happens the way that it happens. And then, as I said, show you a little bit of, of Paris. And the thing I really wanna underscore is that the liberation of Normandy, Operation Overlord, uh, really did little for Paris. As you can see from this map today, I think you can drive it in three, three and a half hours. Uh, certain members of the museum staff could maybe make it in less than three hours, but we won't go there. Uh, but it's very far from Normandy to Paris if there's a German army group in between. So when the, the Operation Overlord begins, it doesn't immediately mean that Paris is going to be saved. And in fact, the Normandy landing is on June 6th. The liberation of Paris doesn't happen until the 24th, 25th of August. So what it means in the immediate near term for Parisians and for the city of Paris is that food supplies immediately begin to drop because Normandy was a critical uh, uh, source of supply for all those cows that you saw in the early video, all the dairy products, beef, apples, all of the things that the wonderful, rich agricultural area of Normandy is known for. It also meant that Paris took on a new definition for the Germans as a place where they could use the rail network and road networks that come through Paris, either to move soldiers to the west to meet the Allied invasion, or later on to begin to move soldiers to the east as they're trying to get them out of uh, Western France. The other question, and I'll show you this in just a bit, is what the Allies should do about Paris. They have the option of trying to take the city. Uh, the risk is that you could damage the city quite heavily. The other risk is that none of the Allied soldiers are really trained for urban warfare, so it would be a very difficult operation. Or you could go around the city and try to capture it uh, after the Germans had more or less abandoned it. Or, or you could try to siege it. Uh, and as some of you probably know, shortly after D-Day, Mark Clark, uh, the American general in Italy, made the strategic and operational mistake of going to Rome and allowing German soldiers to escape to the north. And what American commanders here in France are worried about is committing that same mistake, that focusing on Paris might allow the Germans to retreat to the east of Paris. And you can see some of the cities on the map to the east there, Saint-Quentin, Cambrai, Soissons, Chateau Thierry, these are all First World War battlefields. So the notion of allowing the Germans to retreat to that high ground and go back into fortifications along that same line from 30 years earlier is not something that allied generals really wanna think about. So that's why uh, Omar Bradley says this, that Paris represents nothing more than an ink spot on our maps to be bypassed as we headed toward the Rhine. There is nothing in American planning that is designed to capture Paris. Bradley does not want an urban battle for the city. He doesn't want to have to, to, to try to besiege a very large city like Paris. Uh, and he's also aware that his forces are just not supplied or aligned to do that. What that means inside Paris, of course, is that conditions continue to get worse and worse and worse as food supplies begin to dwindle. And frankly, as the Germans take everything they possibly can out of the city, they take food, they take fuel, they take vehicles, everything they can take out. This man that you see here wearing the beret is going to become the leader of the French resistance inside Paris. His name is Henri Rotangui. His wife, uh, his wife Claire uh, Rotangui, just passed away just a couple of years ago. It's maybe two or three years ago. Uh, he's the leader of the group called the FFI, the Force, Force Française de l'Intérieur, and the FTP, the, the partisans that are inside Paris. Uh, Rotangui is not all that sure that he wants to link his forces inside the city to Charles de Gaulle. Eventually, at the end of August, early September, he will do that. But at this point inside Paris, he wants to lead an uprising from inside the city. He wants Paris, in effect, 
to liberate itself. And I'll show you some of the ways that Henri Rotangui is commemorated in Paris today uh, as his memory and his role is being remembered a little bit more. The other thing that Rotangui and other leaders of the French resistance know is that it would make no sense for them to rise up inside Paris unless there's some hope of help coming from the outside. As you can imagine, these are men uh, with very few weapons and in a few cases women, I should, I should be careful to add, uh, fighting with small arms against German forces that have armor, that have tanks, that have heavy equipment. Uh, the, the beautiful Jardin de Luxembourg, where the French Senate is right now, is where the Germans kept some of their tanks in the beautiful gardens that are, that are in Luxembourg right now. The key moment in the liberation, the key moment that's going to force everybody's hand, including Henri Rotangui's hand, is on August 19th when the Paris police go on strike rather than give up their weapons to the Germans. And I'll show you how that's commemorated here in just a second as well. The big fear that everybody has, everybody in France, all of the American commanders, is that if there is an urban battle inside Paris, it could be destroyed the way that Warsaw was destroyed. And those of you who have been to Warsaw will know from walking around that city uh, the damage that it suffered in the Second World War. The old town of Warsaw has been completely rebuilt since 1945. It was so completely destroyed that the architects rebuilding Warsaw had to go to London to look at paintings in the National Gallery to figure out what colors the building should be. Obviously, nobody wants to see that happen in Paris. On the other hand, American generals, French generals, no, British generals even, know that they can't leave men like Henri Rotangui in the city simply to be slaughtered, and they can't allow the city to literally starve to death. So this is going to create this, this human drama that's going to begin in the last few days of August. The German commander is this man, Dietrich von Koltitz. The building in the bottom left is the Hotel Maurice on the Rue de Rivoli. It is, Nathan, if I, if I think I'm correct on this, only a couple of blocks from where we'll be staying on the Paris pre-tour. It's very close to the Tuileries and to the Louvre. It's been completely redesigned on the inside. So if you go inside, nothing looks the way that it would have looked in 1944. Nevertheless, the, the building is there. Um, this is something I'm happy to talk about in Paris or even in the Q&A here if anyone's interested. Koltitz developed a reputation after the Second World War as a man who could have destroyed Paris and decided not to. That is a complete lie and fabrication made up by him and made up by uh, the then mayor of Paris, the collaborationist mayor of Paris, who is one of the Tattinger Champagne uh, heirs in 1944. So I'm not gonna put Christophe on the spot, but I have French friends who won't drink Tattinger Champagne for this very reason. Uh, they drink uh, Vouvray instead. Christophe is, is putting his finger up. Uh, so what Koltitz wants to do is to keep Paris open so that he can actually move forces in and out of the city as needed. What he doesn't want is a rebellion inside the city. So in his mind, the best of all options, if it looks like Germany is going to lose Paris, the best of all options is to lose it as, in as orderly a fashion as possible. He is himself worried that if he and his officers are taken by men like Raoul Tanguy, they'll just be killed outright. What he would prefer to do is to surrender to somebody in a uniform, preferably an American uniform, so that the rules of war will apply to him. So Koltitz is in some ways the most interesting of the, the, the figures here in 1944 in Paris, because the real Dietrich von Koltitz and the one that develops after the Second World War are two completely different people. My favorite character, my favorite individual, I shouldn't say character of this, is this man, General Philippe Leclerc. Uh, he is the commander of the Second Armor Division, the Deuxième Division Blende, that has been fighting Germans and fighting the collaborationist Vichy French uh, since Central Africa in 1940. Uh, Leclerc had to change his name so that his family still living in France would not be punished by the Germans. He is the most respected field commander in the French army. Uh, he reports to an American Corps commander who doesn't like him very much, uh, but Leclerc is going to do everything he can, every day he can, to move his second armor division closer and closer and closer to Paris, so that when the moment comes uh, to come into the city, it will be his unit, a French unit, that will come into the city. So he's very careful to hoard food and fuel, to hoard weapons, to make sure that his men have what they need. 
And the image on the right is a picture that I took several years ago. Uh, if you know Paris, if you've been to Notre Dame Cathedral, if you're standing with your back to Notre Dame and you look across the forecourt, you'll see a gigantic building, one of the biggest by area in the city of Paris. And that's the Prefecture de Police. That's the police headquarters. And this is the monument there that commemorates the rising of the Paris police. Uh, the, the first time in four years that the French flag, that beautiful tricolor, had been seen inside the city is when the Parisian police uh, run it up the flagpole. Uh, it's a dramatic moment. I talk about it in the book. Uh, Marie Curie's uh, um, godson, I think it's her godson, uh, rushes to the Paris police with chemicals. They empty the champagne that's in the basement in, in the police department's own private champagne cellar, and they make Molotov cocktails with the chemicals that he brings so they can throw them at German tanks should the Germans come in. Where you're looking at this image, this, this sculpture, around to the left and around to the right, they have left the bullet holes still in the building so that as you're walking through Paris, many of the buildings in Paris, you can still see the damage. The Hotel Dieu, which is not far away, a hospital, also has bullet holes, and the Ecole de Guerre across from the Eiffel Tower, the French War College uh, also still has damage from the war still on the, on the walls. And that's done intentionally in the hope that people will walk past and, and think and remember for a moment. I don't wanna go much further, of course, without making this to be too, um, too much a positive story because there are very ugly sides to it, of course. There is this thing called latente, which uh, refers to, the word is used to describe when you shear animals like sheep. Uh, it's used here to, to shave the heads of women who had had affairs with German officers uh, or who had turned in other French people to the Germans. And there is uh, a, a, been a lot of historical analysis and study on this. The most important book, at least in English on this study, argues that there was a kind of moral economy at work in these neighborhoods. That is, women who had affairs with Germans to feed their family generally escaped this kind of treatment. Women who had affairs, who profited from those affairs by turning in other Frenchmen or lived much better than their, their neighbors and, and, and fellow Frenchmen were typically the ones who were targeted. So there's a very long and very unpleasant history here. There's also something called the Epocation Sauvage, uh, the kind of, um, uh, Christophe, I'm not sure exactly how you would translate it, a kind of wild purging is the way that I would think about it. Uh, and these are the extra legal, the, the, the people in France taking out their vengeance on other French people, those who had collaborated with the Vichy regime. And one of the reasons why Charles de Gaulle is such an important figure in France, one of the reasons why the airport and every other, seemingly every other thing in France is named for him, is that he'll be the person who comes in and reestablishes the state of France and puts a stop to these things and creates an administration, creates a justice system, all of that, out of the wreck that Vichy had left behind. So de Gaulle is going to come out of this on the political sense, very much the most important winner of the liberation of France. And I'll show you that right here. This is the image on the right-hand side. If you're walking down the Champs-Élysées from the Arc de Triomphe, just before you get to the Tuileries and the Place de la Concorde, there is this statue on the right-hand side. And it commemorates the famous march that Charles de Gaulle will take just a couple of days after the liberation, where he and a number of the leaders of France in the 1950s and 60s will take this march down the Champs-Élysées. He will enter Notre Dame Cathedral to say a Te Deum. Uh, there will be a sniper who will take shots at him. Uh, he will not move, not flinch. He'll continue doing what he was doing. The audio of that is on the BBC's website. Then he will go to the Paris City Hall, the beautiful, gorgeous Hotel de Ville, where he'll give an impromptu speech in which he'll say, Paris outraged, Paris broken, Paris martyred, but Paris liberated. And, and setting from the very beginning these words, that Paris had a role in liberating itself, that France liberated itself. You can also see as you walk through the city almost everywhere in central Paris, you'll see markers like these, uh, which are to commemorate those members of the French resistance, those members of the police who died uh, for the liberation. The one on the bottom refers to a gardien de la paix, a police officer, killed on August 21st, 1944, here died for the liberation. And you'll see markers like this all over the city. There is an association that puts flowers in the receptacle that you see at the top so that many of these have flowers that are uh, there to decorate them as well. And again, they're all over Paris. Uh, I hope we'll get a chance to go. Christophe, I don't know if you've been yet, but uh, you're, I, I, I had 
tickets and I had an invitation from the CEO and then COVID hit. Uh, th this is a museum that is dedicated to two individuals and an event. It is a museum dedicated to the liberation itself. It is dedicated to General Leclerc, the general that I mentioned earlier, and also to one of uh, my great heroes coming out of the Second World War, a man by the name of Jean Moulin, uh, who put the French resistance together in effect, uh, was tortured and murdered by Klaus Barbie in Lyon, France. Uh, this used to be on top of the Gare Montparnasse in Paris. The Gare Montparnasse is where the Germans signed the document that formally surrendered Paris uh, to, to uh, the French and to the Allies. They've since built a brand new museum underneath the Place d'Empire Rochereau, which is where Henri Rotangui had his headquarters. Uh, he had worked on the metro, he was an electrician, so he used the, the tunnels underneath the Place d'Enfer Rochereau, uh, to move men and supplies, to cut the Germans' electricity, to tap their telephones. Uh, now they've turned this into a massive museum and memorial that I just can't wait to see. It's also in one of my favorite neighborhoods of Paris, uh, Montparnasse, and not far away uh, is the Cimetière Montparnasse, the Montparnasse Cemetery, where the head of the Vichy government, um, uh, Pierre Laval is buried. So a lot of history right in that. It's also the neighborhood where F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway all had lived in the 20s. So really exciting part of Paris to be in. I, I, I just love it. Great restaurants, great cafes, great energy. One of my favorite parts of the city. And of course, there is the city of Paris itself, which plays in this drama of the liberation. All of these places virtually that you can see uh, play some role. And uh, I just love walking around the city and talking to people about it and being able to envision the city itself as being a part of the story of the liberation. Nathan, I hope I'm not going over too, too long. Christophe was kind enough and Nathan to mention the book on the right. Very quickly, the book I have coming out in October just before this trip uh, will take place is about when France fell in 1940. And the United States is a very controversial decision to recognize the Vichy French government, the collaborationist pro-German government that comes in, and to maintain that recognition until just a few days, really, uh, before the invasion of Normandy, before Operation Overlord, when the United States followed Great Britain's lead and uh, recognized Charles de Gaulle as the head of a provisional government. Uh, this story doesn't always reflect terribly well on the United States government, especially some of its senior leaders, including America's Secretary of State, Cordell Hall. Uh, but it argues that the United States really begins to take World War II seriously when France fell. And it has to, and, and its relationship with the Vichy government reveals both the way that Americans were looking at France, the way they were looking at Great Britain, and the way they wanted to rebuild Europe when all of this is over. Uh, so as you can tell, I'm excited, I'm fired up. I can't wait to see Christophe and have a Calvados and, and, and some good Norman food with him. Uh, and I'm just looking forward to seeing all of you in France and, and having these discussions in France itself. Thanks very much. Yeah. Th thank you, Michael. That was, uh, was fantastic. And um, we'll, we'll have some time here for questions. So we'll give about uh, 10 to 15 minutes or so for, uh, for a Q&A. Uh, first, uh, Marcy Bloom asked, uh, you mentioned a book regarding the treatment of women. Uh, what was that title again? It's called La Tante. Uh, um, uh, the, the book, you mean, regarding it? Yeah. yeah, let, let, me, yeah let me pull that one off my shelf I, so I don't get the title wrong. Uh, and I'll, I'll email it to Nathan and Nathan can get it to you. Uh, there have been two English language studies that have been pretty good, one better than the other. And I'll make sure I get that title to Nathan. Okay. Great. And while some people, you can use the Q&A or the chat box to ask your questions. Um, I'm going to throw kind of the, you mentioned de Gaulle toward the end. Um, we often think of de Gaulle as being a thorn in the side of the other allies. Um, how does that play out within your understanding? Yeah, de Gaulle, is, as many of you I know know, when France falls in June of 1940, he gets on an airplane, he flies to London and begins a, a relationship with the British government. The United States government sees him as this brigadier general, which is a, he's the youngest general in the, in the French army, junior most general in the French army. Uh, one star generals just don't go to London and claim that they're running a government. They just don't do that. There has to be some other authority. So the United States took a long time to warm up to Charles de Gaulle. Uh, de Gaulle didn't do himself any favors at first. He did some things that uh, offended President Roosevelt and the people around Roosevelt. It, it took a long time for that relationship to become functional. It was never warm, um, but it was functional. And I argue in the book, uh, another reason that the British and Charles de Gaulle get along is that they both have an interest in protecting their empires in Africa. And they work together to liberate Ethiopia from Italy 
uh, that gives them this experience of working together. The same thing will happen in a very bizarre episode that happens in Iraq uh, in, in, in 1941 that the British and Free French work together. The US doesn't have any of that with de Gaulle. Uh, they don't like him, they don't trust him, they don't like the people around him. It takes them a very, very long time to realize even if they don't like him, uh, the French people do, and the French people want him to be their president. So you can work against that or you can eventually run with it. But it takes the United States a long time to figure that out. And as I argue in the book, they go through several other potential French leaders before they finally settle on de Gaulle. And that has impacts because as you all know, um, World War II is not the end of the United States' relationship with Charles de Gaulle, of course. He, he will be president of France for a very long time uh, and will continue to be a thorn in America's side for a very long time. Um, so we have a quick one from Robert Knight here, and uh, he's asking when your books are available. Uh, so the Blood of Free Men available now, and I believe your next one is October 18 from Harvard University Press. That's what they're telling me. It should be mid-October. So we we just got done with uh, the very last things that we have to do for the book. Uh, all they're waiting for now is, is physically to get an appointment with the people who print books and bind them. Uh, so we're at the last stages. The other book was published a couple of years ago and Amazon should certainly have it. And uh, Christophe, the book uh, does not release in France until November. We'll smuggle you an American copy. So. I'll bring you one. If you, I'll, I'll bring you one, Chris. If I have a copy, I want you'll my have a son copy. copy. <laughs> if I have a copy, you'll have a copy, my friend. <laughs> uh, so speaking of books, uh, Louise Viejo asks, uh, she's read many books about World War II. Uh, do you have a book that's from the German people's perspective of what happened and how they came to support Hitler or why some people opposed him? You know, I was just having that conversation not that long ago uh, with someone. This Today is the anniversary of the Stauffenberg uh, bomb plot, uh, July 20th. And I was just having this conversation with some folks about kind of the motivations, what was motivating the, the, the bomb plot people. And it's not always a great story either. They're very conservative nationalist Germans who think they can fight the war better if Hitler is gone. So uh, the story is not quite as noble as Tom Cruise uh, makes it out to be. The book that I just read... Um, let me pull it off my shelf here. Sorry to do that. Um, there are two books that I would recommend. There's a very interesting book called A Woman in Berlin. Um, it's a journalist, they now know, it's, it says anonymous, but they now know who the author was. Uh, it takes place in 1945 as the Russian army is coming through uh, Berlin. So it's about the end of the war. So if you wanna read about kind of how all this comes apart, and she is very good at saying, you know, these same people who are now uh, complaining were the first ones lining up to, to identify the Jews and the first ones lining up to support Hitler. The other book that I would recommend is by an historian. It's this historian, Fritz Stern, um, who was a, I think his parents or grandparents were Jewish. By, by this point, they had converted to Lutheranism and had grown up in Germany and left Germany and came to the United States where he was a professor at Columbia. And this book is called Five Germanies I Have Known. And the chapter on Weimar in this book, it does a better job of explaining that process, I think, than anything that I've ever read. Everything Fritz Stern ever wrote is worth worth paying attention to, but this book in particular, he advised Margaret Thatcher on the reunification of Germany at the end of the Cold War. So a, a very interesting guy. Uh, Robert Sykes is asking, uh, who was the Corps commander that Leclerc served under? And maybe this goes into how did Leclerc's unit fit within the whole Allied uh, operation anyway? Yeah, it's General Giraud, uh, G-E-R-O-W, who is the, the overall corps commander, who um, got to the point that he wouldn't even say Leclerc's name. He would just refer to him as this miserable man. Um, so uh, the relationship was not good. Uh, and the relationship initially with Patton, who is the army commander, uh, wasn't good either until Patton sort of begrudgingly came to the realization that this is gonna happen and we can either accept it or not accept it. So the relationships are never good. After the liberation, as the French army is being reformed and grown, they'll move Leclerc's division into a fully French corps. Uh, but it has to be that way because of course the exiled French government doesn't have the capability to produce its own weapons, its own gasoline, its own vehicles. So it needs to have a larger command structure to do that. Uh, kind of a heavy question here from Diane Ames. Um, when did the German people know about the concentration camps and the gassing of Jews, among others? Uh, she sometimes read it was not until after the war. 
Yeah, I find that very difficult to believe. I think it's very hard to know. Um, there has been an intense debate among historians about this. Um, a, a Harvard scholar named Daniel Jonah Goldhagen, who has argued that they, they knew right from the beginning that you can tell this from correspondence, you can tell this from official documents. Um, you know, I, I think I think it's pretty hard not to see it by late 1942, 1943, unless you really don't want to see it. So um, it's a hard thing to study because nobody writes down in a document, hey, I learned about the Holocaust or I learned about the mass murder of Jews today. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. But this is happening on such an enormous scale uh, all throughout the German bureaucracy and German society that it's difficult unless you really didn't want to see it. By 1942, 43, the evidence was there um, for you to see it. Um, I don't know that all historians would agree about that. The Americans knew by the summer of 42, it's popping up in the American media by the summer fall of 1942. If it's popping up in the American media, it certainly was, was well known in the German as well. German society, if not German media. And uh, I'll probably one question just popped up. Uh, David Jones, I have a book from a man who lives in Cologne, boy with a white flag that gives a German perspective. Uh, have you read Code Girls? Very interesting story. Yeah, I have. Um, you know, the, the, the first thing they teach you in graduate school in history is be careful about people's memoirs and be careful about what they say after the event is over because they're trying to build themselves a story. They're either trying to make themselves um, seem as though they were more important than they were or they're trying to exculpate themselves from something bad that they did. Um, one of the things I love about Charles de Gaulle is that he's never shy about saying, yes, this was me. I did all of this. I fixed it. Uh, so it, it's wonderful stuff. Um, but you have to be careful with memoirs that are trying to exculpate as well. So I, obviously, memoirs are an important source for what historians do, but I'm always careful to double and even triple check anything in there to see whether I think it's reliable. And if it's not, I'll just come right out and say, in his memoirs, person X said, and sometimes in a footnote, I might even say, but I haven't been able to corroborate any of this. On that subject, a figure that's very popular that we know of in the liberation of Paris would be Hemingway. Uh, do you have yeah. any, any thoughts on Hemingway's time in Paris in 44? Yeah, Hemingway does everything he can and succeeds in being in uh, the first few Americans to get into the city. He pulls every string that he can. Um, Famously, Hemingway, another one who could write memoirs to make it seem as though he was a far more important and consequential figure than he was. Uh, but he uh, immediately went to the Ritz Hotel where Coco Chanel was living as a German collaborator uh, and immediately went, as he put it, to liberate the bar of the Ritz. So if you go to Paris, even if you're not staying at the Ritz Hotel, uh, you can go to the bar. And now you could probably go to the bar. Uh, Christophe probably knows it's sometimes a several hour wait to go to the bar. It's a very, very small bar, uh, but it's still there. Uh, I had the privilege of going there and having a glass of champagne with a friend of mine a few years ago. Uh, and that was where Hemingway went. He went to liberate his favorite bar. Why not? <laughs> he also liberated a very famous bar at Mont Saint-Michel in Normandy. Oh, is that right? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it was just a few days after the official liberation of Mont Saint-Michel on August 1st. And on August 6th, it was not very stabilized. The situation was not very good. But he was in and then went to the Parano bar to drink Cavados with local people. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we could go on with this for, uh, for days. And uh, that's why you'd have to join us on the beaches of Normandy to the River Seine. Uh, we'll definitely be getting uh, Michael Nyberg on more tours. I think I even poked him at future Mediterranean uh, programs, a lot with Vichy and, and de post-war de Gaulle in Provence and Corsica and the French mindset that uh, we'll, we'll be asking Mike about uh, in future years as well. Uh, Christoph, Michael, thank you for joining us and uh, for all you viewers. Uh, we hope to see you on a tour or here at the museum soon. So thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> a très bientôt, Christophe. A bientôt, Michael. <laughs>